Welcome everybody to the Thrive History Podcast, Mastering the Art of Thriving at Life, where we talk about creating change in our lives and in the world around us. I'm your host, JJ. This is your co-host, Gigi. Say hi, Gigi. Hi. And um, you might notice that she's outside in the sun, but she might be getting a little dark, a little bright if you guys are watching the video. And that's because um, last time we did this, she got a sunburn from sitting out in the sun so long. So she's in the shade, but outside. <laughs> I did my best. I moved the camera into the sun. I thought maybe that would help. So far, so good. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's working out. Um, but uh, today we're going to talk about um, uh, this concept of decision fatigue and uh, kind of life principles and kind of identity. So it's, it's sort of three three things and how they're all linked together. Um, for those of you guys who are parts of gyms and especially for those of you who own gyms, I think it's going to be really important because we're going to tie the community piece into how those those three things um, tie together: decision fatigue. Um, uh, identity and and uh, <laughs> what was the third one, Gigi? Decision fatigue. I don't know. You're rambling prin already. <laughs> prin principles and principles and like kind of life rules of thumb or life things that guide our guide our um, our decisions. And then we have this awesome article that's talking about um, surgical intervention. So when people, especially when it comes to chronic pain, you know, there's a lot of surgeries that go on. Millions of people get surgery every year for bad knees, shoulders, bad backs. And what are what are the results? Are people getting uh, um, benefit from this? Are they are is it healing or the pain or is it removing the issue? And how does that compare to maybe other treatments or no treatment? And uh, um, and is surgery something that most people should jump should jump at? So we'll come to that later. But uh, this this uh, uh, podcast is coming a few weeks after um, the article that you guys might have already taken taken a gander at, which is um, where I talk about these three things, and. It kind of comes from this idea, um, I, you know, I've, uh, the 12 Rules for Life with Jordan Peterson. I haven't read the book yet, but I've been following him for a long time and just kind of seeing what he had to say. And uh, just life in general, like there's, there's certain, you know, overarching principles that, um, that people start sort of fall into. And sometimes they're beneficial and sometimes they're not. And, you know, we talk a lot about routines and kind of creating routines so we have to make less decisions. And I think that's kind of where principles come in. You know, and, and Gigi brought this up earlier um, with identity. And if if you can, uh, um, you know, if if this principle is part of your identity, it makes the decision. It takes the decision out of it. You're pre-deciding the decision, right? You don't have to. There's no willpower required. If you're the person who exercises regularly, and you've been really busy and you haven't worked out for a week, you're good, you're the type of person who works out regularly. People like us do this. People like me do this. I need to make time to do something physical because it's part of my identity. And that's that's what you were talking about, right, Gigi? Yeah, and, and it was interesting because we were actually going to do this podcast about something completely different uh, that I wasn't super into. So <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, I've had this on my mind for a little bit, um, just about like lifestyle and, and making decisions to build the kind of lifestyle that you want. And then it had me thinking about also like, what kind of person do you want to be? And I, I have this great example, um, that was actually my sister. And she said this to me maybe 10 years ago and she was getting a dog and she had always had dogs. And it struck, like, I don't know, like, if you're a university student, having a dog is a huge pain in the ass. Like, I love to travel. I like to, I always worked in bars, and I would work late, and I was always out of my house. And, like, to me, having a dog seemed like a fucking nightmare. And I was, like, this responsibility, like, no thanks. And, and so I so said... It says I was, the woman with three kids. <laughs> <laughs> I made up for it. So, I've, and kids are a lot easier than pets, trust me. But... I, uh, so I said to her, why do you always have dogs? And she said, you know what? Because I decided that I'm the kind of person who it's important to me that I go outside every day. And if you have a dog, you have to take the dog for a walk every single day. And I was like that to me when I was like, you know, in my early twenties, that was so profound because I was like, huh, you've identified the kind of person that you want to be. So I am the kind of person that goes outside every day. That's who I want to be. That's the kind of lifestyle I want to have. You've identified a mechanism that's going to have that for you and you have all, and you, you know, acted on it, right? So you've made your life better and you're closer to living that kind of ideal lifestyle that you want for yourself based around this decision-making kind of principles, right? Like it starts with the principles and then it, you get to the identity and then you get to the actual action item, right? So um, I, I just thought it was so great. And then you could easily use it, like you said, with the working out 
I am a healthy person. Okay, healthy people work out. So now am I going to go for a trail run in the morning? I am because I'm a healthy person. That's what healthy people do. And you don't have to question it all the time, right? And if it becomes a part of your identity, it's just, it's just way easier. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and it comes back to this decision fatigue. So for those of you guys who don't know what decision fatigue is, is um, the more decisions that we have to make and consciously think about what we're going to do, you know? So like the classic example, Steve Jobs always wore the same outfit. And does that mean, is that, was that the secret to his success? No, but it was just, it's just an example that he was like, you know what, I, I have so many big decisions I got to make every day. I don't really care you know, that I have, that I'm some fashion mogul, that I look cool every day. I'm going to wear the same thing. It's comfortable. It works for me. You know, it works in a lot of scenarios. Um, I'm just going to wear the same thing every day. And I don't have to think. I just go put my jeans and my black turtleneck on, which is kind of his signature thing. And, and so, you know, you think about throughout the day, and this is why parenting is hard. This is why like being a manager or running, running an organization is hard is because you're not only making decisions about your own life. You have to make decisions about the company and all these other people all the time. And <laughs> That, that starts to wear yourself down, bless, bless you. And, 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 um, and it makes it harder when you wanna say no to the gummy bears or you, you know, you're driving home and you, 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 you know what you're gonna make for dinner but then there's this drive through and it's right there, it's on the way home, it'll save you time and effort and you don't have to think about cooking or anything like that. It's, it may not even save you that much time because a lot of times making a healthy meal is gonna take you 20 minutes and that's how long it's gonna take you to divert to the drive-through anyway, you know? Yeah, and, right. and, it'll, and it'll probably cost you more money too than, than the, the food you've already got at home from the grocery store. But it becomes, it's just an easier decision. And, and um, you know, I, I talk about in this article that the, um, that we've, that the world has become convenient to a fault you know, where the, these companies have deliberately made things more and more convenient to remove barriers for you to say, you know, so you won't have a reason to say no. And then, of course, we're bombarded, which means we're having to, to make these decisions all the time. So then we're fatigued we, and then we're more likely to just do it, right? Like, I'll just buy this thing or this ad comes up or, oh, that looks cool. I'm just going to buy it. And you don't really have the, have the bandwidth to sit there and think about, like, is this really something I need right now or should I be doing this right now? You know, you think about something like Netflix and, and it's deliberately designed to keep you engaged. You know, Facebook and YouTube are deliberately designed to keep you on the platform as long as possible. So it actually takes like a conscious decision to stop, but you're already fatigued and being in that environment makes you more fatigued. So you stay on longer. And so, this, go ahead. I was, no, what were you going to say? Done? Done ramble? No, I got more to go. <laughs> Um, I was going to say with the, with the Netflix thing, if you identify yourself as someone who doesn't watch a lot of TV, which is, I know is something that everybody says, but everybody fucking does it. Right. But if you truly are like, no, I don't watch a lot of TV and you catch yourself doing that, you know, Netflix, are you still there? And you've done it like three times in a row. Then you got a question like, Oh wait, what am I doing? I don't watch this much TV. I'm not the kind of person who binges stuff. And it, it's that easy to break the habit because you just redefine yourself as something else and your identity no longer aligns with it. And then it's like, just walk away. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it, it's a constraint, you know, so principles a lot of times are constraints. And, you know, they talk about when it comes to like freedom and responsibility, um, you know, that's stressful because it has, it takes conscious thought. And if, if we're free to do anything we want, and this is why adulting is hard, right? It, you know, we're, we, we, if we want to go to the store and buy a gallon of ice cream and eat it right now, we can, like, there's nobody who's going to stop us. If we want to sit and watch five hours of Netflix in an evening, we can, and, and other responsibilities and constraints may, may change that. But in general, we do that, you know, we, we have that option. And this is actually, you know, not to get kind of even more psychological and political, but like this is, some, I think, why a lot of people don't mind being told what to do from the government, right? Like, because they don't want to have to think. They don't want to have to decide, you know, what the best medical program is for them or, or you know, where to put their money in charities. They just let the government take it and let them handle it, right? Because it's less decisions. Um, and so, so the principles a lot of times are constraints and, and uh, they, they kind of help keep us, you know, on this path. Now, the, the, the negative side to identity, and I think this is where a lot of people are stuck, is, is that they, they start to believe these things about themselves and their identity that I'm a fat person, right? I have bad genetics. I, you know, um, you know I'm not, I, I can never go to the gym. I'm not that person. And they have these, these ideas in their head, and it really makes it hard because that's like become a principle for them 
that they can't change it. And, and I think that if people really, you know, deep down try to work on the, the identity side and say, you know, maybe I'm not a gym person, but I can find another activity like, you know, walking outside or running or, you know, some other thing that we know, that you know is going to be beneficial and you can tie that to your identity, then you'll get the benefits, benefits of it. So from a, from a community standpoint, you know, there's also a lot of debate, you know, for those of you guys who aren't part of the gym business side, um, people are like, you know, what, you shouldn't try to sell community or promote community as a benefit. Now, if you're currently at a gym, like a small CrossFit type gym or a drive street type gym, like you, you're, you know the benefits of the community. You, you may not be able to say exactly what they are, but it is something that you like. You like seeing your friends. You like having fun events. You like being encouraged. You like, you know, you like the, the vibe, you know, and, and, um, but, but a lot of the kind of business gurus and a lot of gym owners are, are kind of following this thing well, like community is not that important. You know, it doesn't really have any direct benefit to, you know, keeping the business going. And, and um, what I believe is that, is that ultimately what happens is if you do it right, you can get people to tie the gym's community to the group, to their identity. So if they start to feel like th this is who I am. I am a such and such member. This, this, is my, this is my clan, this is my clique, this is who I hang out with. Um, that means that they're gonna start making decisions because they're gonna say people like us do this. People like us come to the gym, try to come to the gym three times per week. People like us sign up for fun events like Tough Mudders and Spartan Races. People like us try to eat better. We're all on different paths and journeys, but we try, we make an effort. People like us tr just try to be better humans. Right, we try to we try to um, treat our bodies correctly and treat our minds correctly, and it, and and because of their identity starts to associate with that. And I've seen this countless times in all the gyms that I've run, where people who were um, uh, really not who you'd expect to be the type of people who exercise and eat better and do these things, just completely change their whole identity and and their whole lives because they got associated with the group, they got they got indoctrinated, they got they got pulled in and loved on. So that now they started making those decisions because they felt like, well, this is what we do. So I, this is what I do now. And again, it took out the decisions part of it. They were, you know, it's still a struggle. Everybody's going to have different habits and routines and, and stuff in their head, but it made it a lot easier to make those better decisions because that's what they do. People like us do this. Yep. Yeah. I which, is, myself. which is a quote from, from Seth Good, not me, by the way. <laughs> I was totally willing to give you credit for that. Um, and, and, and the, you know, and what he's, what he's talking about is that from a marketing standpoint, and he, you know, if you guys don't know anything about marketing, it's not, it's not like this, like, Oh, how do we trick people? It's like, how do you find the people that believe what you believe and, and just so that they can all come together and, and work towards a greater goal, whatever that might be is people like us do this. And, and uh, you know, so when you think about, you know, your identity, you know, so what sort of, what sort of things, do you principles do you do maybe unwittingly um, believe and like I, like I, there's no way I can lose weight um, and because because of who I am and it's like that's not true everybody has options um, and you need to figure out what's going on what's causing that and and you know maybe you had a, a parent or some other authority figure who told you that your whole life you know maybe you had some bad experiences with coaches and gyms um, maybe maybe you uh, um, uh, maybe you have some reasons why you're, you know, things that you're doing unknowingly with your, your eating habits or whatever, you know, to sit there and figure out, okay, what other, how, what's another principle I can use that I can tie to my identity that, that will, again, create those, those guidelines, create those, those, um, those rules to live by so that you can then move it toward the positive. And if you can find the community to support you, you know, that you can help associate with and, and uh, be a part of, that's really going to be beneficial. Yeah, it's amazing when you really think about all the people out there that say two things that come to mind are so common. One is, I have a sweet tooth, right? Oh, I have a real sweet tooth. And it's like, okay, no, you don't. Everybody does. There's, and, nobody, like, there's nobody who doesn't like sweets. Well, there, it's a chemical thing, right? Like, it's, yeah. you know, that's all it is. It's a chemical. It's just like, I really like heroin. Okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thanks yeah. That concept. And then the second one is, I don't like to exercise. And if, if you're trying to lose weight and you qualify yourself as someone who has a sweet tooth and doesn't like to exercise, you have just built yourself the world's steepest hill to climb up, my friend, because it's like, you're, you're never going to overcome that. And because you're always going to be like, oh, it's so hard for me because I have a sweet tooth. 
I can't walk by a bakery without eating a pastry because I have such a sweet tooth. I can't have a coffee without having a cookie because I have a sweet tooth. And it's like literally everything throughout the day is just going to be fucking bombarding you because of who you've decided that you are, you know? And the thing is, it's like, just change. Like, and I say that like, Oh, just change. Like, Oh, it's so easy, you know? (laughs) But, but if you kind of shifted from, I don't like exercise to, I haven't found an exercise that I like yet, you know, Mm. or, I like sweets, uh, but I only like them once in a while, or I, I really enjoy them the most on the weekends, you know, something like that. Where you well, get- I, I really, I really enjoyed this and I, and I use it in my parenting. Um, it was some parenting book and it said like, don't ever put labels on your kids um, uh, because it tends to be self-fulfilling prophecies, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so's so-and-so's uh, really smart. Well, when you say that about them, then, then they tend to start, um, thinking that they're smart and they're less likely to take risks and, and do things that might make them look less smart or foolish because they don't want to, they don't want to prove that they're not. And this is, this has been proven in multiple studies that when you tell kids that they're smart, they're less likely to take on the next challenge because they've already achieved the smart status. But if you tell kids that they worked hard, then the kid, then those kids are more willing to take on the next hard problem. Um, or, or just, you know, say anything. So you say, you know, um, Oh, you're, they'll say like, I'm not good at this. And you say, well, you're not good at it yet. You know, you, if you work hard and you, know, you, you teach them the whole idea that you can always improve, whether it's cognitively or physically or whatever, you know, we're always changing. And it's the same thing with, you know, I have a sweet tooth right now, it, probably because I eat too many sweets, which reduces my sensitivity to sweetness. And so I end up eating them more. I used to have a sweet tooth. It was like, this was not, this was a thing. I used to drink soda every day had a big sweet tooth. I ate way more candy than my wife. Like, like I was, I was, I had a sweet tooth, like no, no doubt. And by the way, I still hate exercise. So, (laughs) but, but, uh, um, but I, but I don't view exercise as a mean in and of itself. Now I look at it as a way to stay healthy and be able to do fun things and, and be able to keep myself looking fit. Like those are the reasons why I continue to exercise is not because I just, I need to exercise. And, and the sweet tooth went away as I started to, started to change my diet a little bit, a little bit. Like it's really hard for me to drink a whole can of soda or pop if you're from the North. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's just too sweet. Like it really is. And, and I do have, you know, like I said, everyone has some sort of sweet tooth. It's just sometimes, you know, if you eat it all the time, you're not as sensitive to it. And so you can say, I have a real sweet tooth right now. I know that if I, if I can, uh, um, cut back on my sweet, sweet intake, I know that I, that I won't need to eat as much to feel, to fulfill that, that desire. Um, and so when you talk about your identity stuff, remember your identity can change and, and these principles can change. And so, you know, if you can, especially when you have one that's, that's holding you back or that's negative, you can say like, re, you re, literally refiz, repeat to yourself, you know, write it down, say it out loud, write, say, add, add the, the, the qualifier right now or at this moment, or um, in the past, I've had a sweet tooth, you know, and, and, uh, and, and start training yourself to think about, you know, what are the, what, what, well, what, is, what are you about all about? You know, I think, I think this whole identity politics is a big deal too. You know, identity politics has to do with people uh, associating their identity with being someone who cares about people and doesn't want to cause any hate and doesn't want, you know, and so then they start getting, they actually can take it a little too far on both sides. Right. And, and uh, it becomes they, they tie their identity too much to these to these, um, you know, political groups or 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 social groups when it's, when it's like every every person. Bless you again. Thank you. Um, uh, it, you know, the, the they tie themselves too strongly to these things and they just start believing. And again, it's, it's decision fatigue. They don't want to have to analyze every topic. So they just go with what the party says, because that's who I am. I'm a you know, I'm a super conservative you know, religious person, or I'm a, I'm a very, uh, very liberal, you know, uh, um, uh, person that, that, you know, is in that camp. And then, so other people start saying, you don't even, you don't even try to analyze across the, across any lines because you don't want to make decisions and it's because it's tied to your identity. And I think that if people understand more about themselves and their identity, they can have better principles and have to make less decisions, um, when it comes to this sort of thing, especially when it comes to health. Yeah. And if you use more transformative language when you're defining yourself, it helps too, right? Like I like self-improvement or I, um, 
I like change. Like things like that where I'm a problem solver, right? You Instead of calling your kid smart, you could say you're a good problem solver because then they're always looking for problems to solve, right? Which isn't a, can be challenging in of itself. I know that. <laughs> but, but it's like if you, there's, you could, you can always take the thing and make, and still achieve that thing without trapping yourself in that box, but saying, here's the spirit of that thing. And this is the language that I'm going to use. Right. So you can kind of recognize it. I'm getting a little bit philosophical here right now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But well, another one that, that I, that I hear often is I'm all or nothing, right? That's a real common thing I hear all the time is I'm an all or nothing kind of person. And, and it's like, okay, well, are you, or, or is that just kind of the identity that you've taken because of your past experiences and what are the positives and what are the negatives of that? Because usually the all or nothing people that I, that, that I'm thinking about specifically, um, they, they, they go for these huge swings, right? Where they're literally their whole diets change, they're training all the time and they're just all, you know, but then other parts of their lives start to come apart, their social things, their family things, their work things because they're chasing this, this ideal. And then of course there's eventually a cliff and then they fall off and then they don't do anything, you know, and it's, and, and, and or there's a huge, and then there's a huge backswing and, and a backslide and it's like, okay, so you're an all or nothing, nothing person, but does it have to be all or nothing where it's this laundry list of things that you're all in on? Or can you be all or nothing on getting good sleep? <laughs> can you be all or nothing on, you know, uh, not eating crap every day? you know, and, and, and live what like if, that. What if you were all or nothing on moderation? <laughs> I'm all or nothing on moderation. I like that. It's a good, good life quote. Um, and, and, and on that note, I, I think I haven't decided yet, but I, I, I have been trying to think, figure out what my next tattoo will be. And it will probably be something around the quote, um, this too shall pass. Um, and, uh, which is not a biblical quote, uh, interestingly enough. Um, Why is that? Are the, all of your tattoos biblical quotes? No. No, but everyone thinks it's part of the Bible. Um, really? Uh, yeah, the, the, a lot. I mean, everyone just assumes it's the, the Bible quote. It sounds like something out of the Bible. But uh, um, I think it's a, I think it's an ancient Sumerian. I'm not sure. But but uh, no, it's 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 interesting because you know I first I think I first sort of like started living that as a mantra when I was in in, in dark periods or down periods or stressful or busy or whatever periods. And but it also means a lot for successful periods because you get on this high and you assume things are going to be going great forever and that too shall pass you know the whole idea the real concept is is that and i think this is where a lot of people get stuck in their identity and their principles and i think in the world in general people just assume that because it is the way it is now it's going to be like that forever right or just yeah. because things have been like that up until now but the, our bodies, the world, everything is, is a system of systems. It's constantly dynamic and changing. And, uh, you know, this too shall pass. So whether it's your identity that you're tying yourself to, whether it's a busyness or a period of your life that you're frustrated with or having success with, just know that this is not going to be permanent, that things are going to be, always be changing. I used this analogy about that today with one of my girlfriends who was like, I always, I feel like I'm always drowning. And she's like, I, I, ha I only have two kids and I have a nanny and she's married and like, they both have great jobs. She's like, I feel like I'm always drowning. And I was like, dude, that's because you stopped swimming. Like you can't stop. You just have to keep going through it. Like instead of looking at a challenging time as like everything pouring on you, think of it as like you're moving through something from point A to point B and it's going to be long and it's going to be challenging. And it's like, if you're running a marathon, you know, it's not easy, but it's worse if you stop in the middle and think about how fucking terrible it is, right? Like <laughs> there's nothing worse than stopping, right? Because that's when you feel like being present in something that is arduous is awful, right? And, and you should absolutely be present and you should experience these things, but you should experience and move on right? Not get trapped in, in, you know, that drowning sensation or that being overwhelmed or the, you know, in grief or whatever it might be, right? Like you have to experience it and move on. And like you said, like this too shall pass. Right? Yeah. And Churchill said, um, when you're going through hell, keep going. Oh, that's like, great. I yeah. Like, that. like, like, don't, don't, you don't stop. You don't like quit. Like, and then, and then you fail or, or you suffer even longer. Like, no, you keep going and, and eventually things will change. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's good stuff. Let's jump into this article. Um, oh my God. Do we even have time? How long have we been going already? <laughs> well, I think, I think this article is good. It, it wouldn't, it won't, um, I don't think 
I don't think it'll take too long to uh, to talk about here. I just got to find it on my on my uh, thing. So again, this article had to do with. Um, uh, let's see if I can pull it up. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, where did it go? It's Persian, by the way. The quote. Yeah. There you go. Here it is, we found it. So this is the, uh, uh, the article that we were talking about. It says, many orthopedic surgeries don't work. That's a pretty pretty basic title. And so um, and we'll share the link here in the description so you guys can, can get a chance to check, check this out. But, uh, um, uh, but what they're basically saying is, is that millions of people get, get uh, orthopedic surgeries every year. Again, for knees, um, hips, shoulders, backs, and, um, and it, where it says, it says many sur surgeries are still being performed at a rate of hundreds of thousands per year. But when you combine it, it's, it's over a million people are getting these surgeries. And you know, one of the first examples that they talk about was they had people who, do, who got a couple different procedures. Um, um, you're gonna have to read these because I'm terrible at this enunciation. Arthroscopic <laughs> knee surgery with, de, with, debrid, with de, debridement, debridement, removal of dam damaged cartil cartilage or bone, or is it lavage? Irrigation with a saline solution. I think um, it's got to be lavage. Yeah, and and uh, so these are two two very common knee surgeries that when people have knee chronic knee pain, um, and and they they go through these procedures, and you know what are the results? You know how soon do people recover? You know does it does it take care of the uh, um, um, the, the the symptoms? And so they you know to test this possibility, researchers conducted a study featuring a sham surgery. Uh, one group of patients received the real knee surgery and the other one's fake, which just involved an incision in the skin and the patients didn't know which one they got. And in the outcomes, there was basically no change. Statistically, um, uh, over, the course, over the course of the next few years, it was basically the same. The sham group did, did just as well as the surgical group on all points in time. So, so again, we, we have something that's a very invasive surgery. When you think about going in and removing pieces of cartilage and bone compared to somebody who just didn't have the surgery, but got the placebo of the surgery. And if, if you guys have been listening to the podcast very long, you know that I'm a, a big proponent of, of, of understanding and using the placebo effect as much as we can uh, for, for good benefit. And I think that, um, you know, there's, there's, some, there's a certain amount of psychology here, and they go on to acknowledge that, that, that uh, when you actually think about the fact that the surgery is a placebo, has some placebo effect, and it's still not showing a huge benefit over not having surgery, it's like, well, how much is the surgery really mattering then if, if, if it can't even beat a, um, beat a placebo? Um, they go on to talk about back surgeries and how there's all this evidence now showing that a lot of like spinal fusion and back surgeries hasn't really been promoted, that people have back pain without structural damage, and then some people have structural damage and no back pain, you know? And, and uh, um, you know, so there's really a lot of, uh, of uh, information missing that we don't have yet about what's causing these chronic, uh, these chronic ailments. And then they, they go on to talk about surgery. So Gigi, what do you think's going on here with the surgeries and uh, you know, have you had any surgeries before? I got my wisdom teeth removed. It's getting more orthopedic, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never broken a bone. I've never had surgery. I've never needed any of that, despite playing a lot of sports growing up. But I think it's because I played a lot of sports and not, I didn't, I was never sp specific, right? Yeah. Anyway, right? I had, what do they call it? I wasn't monosport. Is that what they call it? Multisport. I was multisport. That's mm -hmm. what um, But there's a line in here. Can you go back up? There's, you kind of brushed over it, but there's, they, they put it really bluntly. And I just want to read it out loud because it was just so like in your face. So it goes on about everything uh, a little bit further up, a little, everything that JJ said. Oh no, where'd it go? Oh, I don't know where it is. Where's the line? No, I don't know. I mean, like, here's a quote. This is, there's strong evidence that lumbar fusion is no more effective than uh, conser conservative treatment in reducing perceived disability because of chronic low back pain among patients with gener degenerative spinal diseases. It is unlikely that further research on the subject would, uh, would considerably affect this conclusion. Yeah, so that that's basically saying it, it just doesn't work. But there's a line in here where it says literally, 
they basically just don't work. Um, and I think like anecdotally, uh, that I could probably back that up. Yeah. Like I know a lot of people who, when they get told, okay, you're doing knee surge, but you need to lose 50 pounds first, they're changed their lives and their lives are already better, right? Like they have to lose all this weight and do all this exercise. And by the time the knee surgery rolls around, they're 80% of the way there. And then they get this placebo effect thrown in. And then all of a sudden their knees are better and they can dance again. And it's like, okay, but you know, you got yourself 80% of the way there. And now just by looking at this article, it's so like, did it work? Did it not work? There is something in here. Um, I don't like how they kind of brush over. They're really only looking at orthopedic stuff here. They're not considering like small tissue or soft tissue stuff. Um, there, there's the line. Although this research effectively proved the surgery was useless, it was slow to have an effect on the behavior of surgeons. So it's basically like, like it literally says the research, the surgery is useless. Um, yeah. You wonder, but they don't talk about soft tissue. And I know when they talk about like low back pain, a lot of low back pain comes from people's hamstrings not being in good shape. Like they've shortened because they've been sitting too long and they just don't have a great lifestyle. And I know that that can, that can pull on the low back a lot. So structurally, no, there's nothing wrong with the back. Right, but there or is just, or just hip issues in general, not just tight hamstrings. Yeah. Sometimes people have tight hamstrings and they don't have back pain, but just hip issues in general from sitting. Yeah, yeah, it's just a general example, right? So there's a lot of things that can cause pain across the body, but getting surgery doesn't seem to be like it's going to actually solve anything for you, right? Like my knee hurts, we'll put a new knee in. Okay. Well, it was funny because one of the shoulder things they mentioned was I think it was a labral tear, and they said that. Um, you know, they went in, they followed up with these people and the people, the, the people felt that their shoulder was so much better after the surgery. They went in and did another, um, another scan and it said it looked almost identical to the before the surgery. Like the, the surgery didn't do anything like physically that they could tell a difference. And the people were like, no, it's great. Fix it. Fix me all up. And it's like, oh, well, did it? Because it doesn't, the, according to all of our x-rays and MRIs, it looks the same. <laughs> And so, and, and, and it really, I think it does go back to the kind of the placebo effect and doctors sometimes are feeling pressured to do something. You know, they have a patient who's in pain, the patient's frustrated. And so the doctor, you know, tries to, to use other interventions. Maybe it's, you know, um, especially with, with um, um, this type of mechanical issues, it could be physical therapy and things like that. And then, um, but the person probably isn't doing it. I, th I do think that there's a, there's a big correlation here that, you know, going through the physical therapy and working and working through it and doing your exercises and being consistent and doing it for months uh, um, is a much kind of harder path to do for most people. And so then they don't do it. And then they're like, oh, nothing works. I need to have surgery. And, and, uh, and the surgery is this big, you know, big deal. And then there's this recovery period. Then of course, you, you just, it, it's, it's a sunk cost fallacy too. What, I'm not talking about money, but this, this big, like taking time off work and having the surgery and not being able to train or whatever. And so now you're going to do the rehab, right? And you're going to listen because, oh, I just had surgery. I got to do this. And, and it's a big deal. So then you do all your rehab and then you feel better in, instead of really um, buckling down and doing all the work beforehand. Um, but I think there's a pressure here for, for physicians. Well, they, they'll prescribe the surgery or the drug, right? And so we know this, um, when people think of placebo, they think of a lot of, from a drug standpoint, you know, and there's a lot of evidence that just says that just because you're taking the pill, you, in your mind, you're, you're, you believe it's helping you get better. So you get better. And so the pill may have some effect, but it, a lot of it could just be that you believe it now. Um, placebo, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so, um, you know, so, uh, you know, when it comes to surgeries, you guys, surgeries do work. <laughs> I do believe there are times when people should get surgeries, but, but I think there has been a shift, at least in the circles of people that I work with, that, that you know, surgery is kind of the last resort. It's kind of like, I'm going to try these other things. But just make sure that, that if you are suffering from chronic pain, that you are talking to a professional, you might want to get a second opinion. Um, at least, at least go online and try to find some basic rehab stuff you can do on your own. It's just all over the internet. And there's some really good sources um, for this stuff, like Physicians Fitness with, with Greg Mack, is, who's a friend of both of ours. Um, and, uh, but even just, just um, on Instagram and YouTube, you can find these people. And to, to see if you can move the needle, you know, just, just try to do something a little bit better 
Um, but, but if it's something that still continues or it's been with you for a long, long time, um, go see a professional and, and uh, try to work through your body is an amazing, amazing system. It's an amazing machine that is, that has been refined for millions of years to be able to keep moving and keep thriving. Um, if, if in treated correctly and used correctly and, and you can get over so many things, you know, just as a quick anecdote, you know, my wife tore her, um, her ACL and her meniscus. And so she was doing a max height box jump in class. And she was, she was, you know, this is back before we knew what we were doing. I have to admit, this is 15 years ago or so. And in the box height was like maybe like 36 inches. Good height. She's only, she's only about five, five. Right. So, so, um, uh, and she was jumping up and kind of like just pulling her legs as high as she could in, in place to see like, am I, am I close to this? You know, like how close am I? Like, I'm going to kind of warm up. I'm going to do this. And she did that a, a few times. And then she went to jump on the box. And as she was jumping, she panicked and went to like put her feet back down. Like she was just jumping in place when she was jumping and pulling her legs up high. Well, one of her feet was on the box, the edge of her shoe. Good. So she forced her leg down into the side. So you can imagine the foot up in front of you, in front of the hips sideways and forcing the knee to the side and it tore her meniscus and her ACL. And so she was in pretty, pretty bad shape um, until and so she got to the doctor, you know, uh, a week or two later and, and uh, they said, yep, torn meniscus ACL, we can do surgery and try to repair it. And then, um, and then there'll be this 12 week recovery. Um, but you're already somewhat recovered and, you know, NFL players play a whole season on a torn ACL and, and it doesn't necessarily affect their performance significantly. And he's like, and some people just, they just go keep going. And so you just do your rehab and you work through it and you get better. And then, you know, I think it was like um, six or nine months later, she's, she's squatting 180, 200 pounds, you know, not no big deal. She's PRing her squats. I think, I think eight weeks later, she, she walked the, the Tough Mudder with a knee brace on. She's way more hardcore than I am. Um, <laughs> but, but again, it was just an example of the surgery wasn't required, you know, and, and I, think, so I think there is a shift. Um, but again, I think a, a lot of doctors, especially when dealing with average people, people who aren't dedicating time and energy in their lives to taking care of their fitness and doing these things. Um, they, they end up defaulting the surgery because the per they know the person's not going to do their rehab anyway. Cool. I think that's it. I hope you guys enjoy. I hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, the podcast kind of a long meandering thing through principles and identity and decision fatigue. And then we jumped into this uh, kind of placebo effect and uh, why you shouldn't, think about surgery or, or as a main option. And for you guys as coaches, this shouldn't be a big surprise. And it, it should be something that we're promoting. When, you, when a client comes to you and says, the doctor wants to do surgery, you don't want to be like, no, that's stupid. Don't do surgery. But <laughs> because you also know they're going to quit or cancel for a while while they go through the surgery uh, rehab. Uh, you know, so it sounds like, you know, kind of conflicting interests. But you might want to say, hey, you might want to get a second opinion because ultimately a lot of these surgeries end up being no better than just doing rehab. You know, so so make sure that you're 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 helping protect um, the people that you're that you're uh, um, teaching and working with. That's it, guys. Thanks a lot, and thrive on. Gigi. Bye. <laughs> yeah, say bye again. Say bye, Gigi.